Welcome back to the special edition of Newsmakers. My guest is Dr. Augustin Carstens, the head of the BIS, the uh, Bank of International Settlements. Well, uh, with that, let me come to a project which is after your own heart and our hearts too, the Finternet. Uh, that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a project which uh, Dr. Carstens and Nandan Nilekani of India have tried to put together. It's an international payment system, uh, payment plus system. Dr. Carstens, first tell us, this seems to be a labor of love for you. Uh, tell <laughs> us what you have in mind in terms of the Finternet. What is the BIS trying? Well, I mean, I think, uh, let me make an emphasis on what you said, that this is a payment plus uh, effort. I mean, I think during the last uh, many, many years, uh, at least a decade, in the different parts of the world, there has been major efforts to in incorporate technology into the financial practices. But if we compare that effort with other developments, for example, the development of the iPhone, where you can do many, many things out of your handheld device, uh, we cannot say that that is the case in financial transactions. Uh, you know, I remember uh, 15 years ago, last time, uh, 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 or one of my first times I came here to India to call to Mexico was almost impossible. Yes. <laughs> Yesterday I called my mother uh, through WhatsApp in three seconds. <laughs> you know, so that's a dramatic uh, development. The same thing could happen, should happen in the payment system. Now, we have made uh, efforts starting mostly through payments. And I think the developments that you have ha here in India are top of the class. I mean, all what you have done with the DPI and UPI yes. is really remarkable. Now, the financial system is not limited to payments. There is, there is many other transactions, financial transactions, that are important. And you know, here in India, for you, uh, there has been a lot of debate and progress in terms of inclusion, but we measure inclusion by uh, the access that the population have, have to accounts, sometimes how much they, they use it. Uh, but you know, if you go through the range of financial transactions and you go to more complicated transactions, the figures of, infl of inclusion drops dramatically. And a lot of this is just because to bring financial services to the population, especially the most sophisticated ones are very expensive. Transaction costs are very, very high. Now, technology can change that, you know. We have, and, and, and technology and thinking in a broader sense. Technology conditioned a lot the way we organize financial services. Our financial services that are more dominated by concerns of the intermediary or the type of operation. But what uh, we, I discussed with Nandan, and he was absolutely fabulous in this process, is the fact that we wanted to do a system or build, or have a vision more than any articulated vision, where the financial system is concentrated in the individual, where the individual can do any type of transactions with anybody they want, no matter in which location, at any time. Just like the way you use your, your iPhone. Now, what is very significant is the technology is there. Basically, by using tokenized assets or tokenization of financial assets and cre creating unified ledgers, you can really build an architecture where from a technological point of view, this vision can materialize. So, uh, you know, uh, and it, it has been a fabulous, uh, uh, a fabulous uh, interaction with Nandan. Uh, it was an effort of bringing financial minds together with technological minds. Uh, so the way this happened is that uh, I wrote a paper presented in Singapore last year I came to the G20 here in Bangalore. I met with Nandan, he's a very dear friend, and I said, Nandan, how do you do this 
bring this into reality. And he said, no problem, we can do this very quickly, <laughs> you know. So I think in this way, that's, that's also another interesting way where uh, finance can contribute with technology and put something on the table. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a steep, steep way up. Yes. At the moment, you still have the SWIFT. You still have to go through several banks and a transaction between two countries can take several days. Do you see, you know, for instance, uh, India-Singapore transaction happening quickly with India's UPI and Singapore's, I think, pay you or something, or likewise in the US, uh, the Fed now. Do you see that happening where, you know, uh, uh, inter-country inter transactions can happen quickly? I think at this stage, something where technology is helping us a lot is that there are many costs in cross-border transactions from the point of view of know your client and anti-pony laundering and combating the financial of terrorism. Now that is a task, the surveillance of that, that's a task that can be digitalized and can make extremely efficient, even more now with artificial intelligence. So a lot of, we are cutting costs there. Now, some of the designs of these, of these uh, projects also is trying to make simpler the foreign exchange transaction that is another leg of a cross-border payment that usually is complex and is expensive. Uh, and then obviously the different communications, dispute settlements and so on and so forth. Uh, the nitty gritty becomes very complex very soon, <laughs> but uh, we are really uh, dwelling through it and I think we're making uh, fast progress. Okay, uh, well, but there is a political angle to it as well. Uh, you know, especially after the COVID and the high fiscal deficit in the United States, the Ukraine war, the derecognition of uh, Russian assets. There is a bit of a scare about dollar as a reserve currency. That also has propelled bilateral, uh, you know, search for bilateral payments without going through uh, the, uh, you know, the central uh, uh, clearing uh, in the United States. Do you see at all uh, the dollar uh, the significance of the dollar, the predominance of the dollar reducing? I don't think so. I mean, at the end of the day, the dollar uh, has developed the main avenues. Is At the end of the day, financial transactions de depend on the credibility of the currency. And at the international level, there is no more credible and reliable currency than the U.S. dollar. And my, uh, my strong feeling or belief is that the dollar will prevail as the main payment, uh, main currency in the international financial system. Okay. Well, to come back to you know, alternative payment systems, uh, India is betting a lot on the CBDC. Uh, we have some kind of uh, retail CBDC, but it's a pilot. Do you see CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, making some headway in terms of intercurrency pay, uh, country, uh, country payments? Eventually, I think CBDC could, could be used in payments, uh, mostly at the wholesale level. Now, CBDC at the end of the day is a, a different re technological representation of money. At the, it's not a new currency, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, uh, you have to really conceptualize a CBDC in that respect. Uh, is a more efficient representation of money, but at the end of the day, it cannot change the nature of the currencies that are be, be behind that, those CBDCs. Yes, uh, I guess along with Finternet, maybe one day uh, it can make some headway. But CBDCs in India at least were conceived more to draw people away from cryptocurrencies. Yes. Do you think that threat is over? You know, at one time it looked like it would become a rival mode of uh, payment. Is that something that worries you? Definitely. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a, a quest where we cannot leave our guard down. Yes. Uh, I think the main problem 
is that uh, cyber currencies are represented uh, or are presented as a substitute for fiat currency without the attributes of fiat currency. And therefore, many, many people can have losses as, as it has materialized. On top of the fact that many of these uh, payment vehicles or, or these vehicles are used to uh, conduct illegal transactions. Uh, therefore, it's not desirable at all that you have uh, avenues out there where illegal transactions can take place. You know, for example, ransom payments for cyber attacks and narco yes. trafficking, different type of trafficking and so on and so forth. That's why I think that uh, uh, we really need to put the rein on c cyber currencies. Uh, it is clear that in many cases those cyber currencies do not comply with the three attributes of money, which is a good m a means of payment, a good store of value, a good unit of account. Some have matured and have become a, 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 an investment or speculative alternative. In some cases, they are being regulated, <clears throat> and, and so they have found their way into broader financial markets. But I think that uh, we should not allow them to proliferate in a way that uh, can make people incur losses or, or be deceived. Okay. Well, I'm running out of time. Just a final question. Uh, would you worry that uh, the way political uh, international relations are evolving, uh, there is a big threat to the growth of world trade? We don't know how the U.S. elections will go, but there are threats of higher tariffs, uh, especially against uh, China or even generally. Would you worry that we are in a space where international trade is threatened and therefore the world economic growth pace? Yeah, I have to recognize that in the last several years we have seen a fragmentation in the global economy and uh, that's not good for the world as a whole. So yeah, I, regretfully I have to say that it is a, is, is a subject matter that uh, should, could hinder economic growth and development. Okay. We do hope the world will move away from the brink if it were to find itself in that position. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much Dr. Carstens for spending time with us at CNBC TV 18. It's a signal honor for us. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs>